when I told his story, I mean, there's just so many layers of things. Nagme Abedini, does everybody remember when this Iranian named Saeed was in prison? We all prayed for him to get out of prison and stuff. And he kind of went crazy. So, and left his wife and after he got out. And, you know, that part of the story is a bad deal. But Nagme, his wife, has always walked on with the Lord, regardless. So, about two years ago, Nagme called us because she's from Iran. And uh, how home church got raided, and a mother and her daughter were fleeing, and they need to get out of the country. So she knew, we knew someone in Georgia, Vlad and Savetta. So uh, we called Vlad, and Vlad said, well, I don't know an Iranian, but I know someone who does know an Iranian. And so that was Babic. So. The whole reason those two ended up together was because of us over here in an entirely different uh, related situation. Is that amazing? Yeah. I mean, when you start looking at God's fingerprints on things, it just blows you away. And the, uh, the, the printing press that they have there, so their whole deal, they'll be training students how to run this so that when they go back to Iran, they can have an underground printing rather than smuggling Bibles in. They'll just be printing them there. So what they're going to be able to do is take a Farsi Bible and they're going to, they're going to print one with margins like this wide down the sides of it so that just like you guys do, they can take notes in their margin as, as we take them through the Bible. Is that crazy? That's great. Right. Then, at that pastor's conference I went to in Downey, right before we went, David Guzik was there, David and Inga, and he was only there for a few hours, but I said, hey, I'm going to the Republic of, of Georgia. We're going to start reaching out to Iranians. He said, you're kidding me, because... I'm trying to get my commentaries translated into Farsi. And he said, I have part of them translated, but I need somebody to proofread because, you know, it takes more than one person to make sure everything is said right. And I said, well, we have somebody because we're paying to have Chuck's book, Why Grace Changes Everything, translated. So we've sent all of David Gusick's stuff over there to be translated. I mean, it, it's like, so David and Inga will be going over there and teaching as well. And, uh, yeah, we should be operational in three or four months. So, to finish off the building. Is that awesome? Passport? Or you don't even need a passport? A passport, yeah, that's all it takes. It doesn't take a visa to get over there. And here's the deal. Pakistanis can come, Iranians, Iraqis, uh, Afghans, Turkish, Saudi Arabia, anybody from the Middle East can come, Americans, British, Russians can come. Uh, so, I know you're not Russian, but you're close enough. close enough to Russia. And then the goal is eventually to have a Russian Bible college there as well, because we can't have a Bible college in Russia right now. Yeah, I've already talked to Max. It's, it's like a given, right? I thought you were joking. <laughs> I thought I was joking. You can't tell if you're testing my humility or actually <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it too much. I should go. I'm going to be my roommate here soon, so it's all right. I'll fix them. I got them. David, we have a solitary confinement room. <laughs> So, I went through Nehemiah real fast on Sunday. I want to go through it slower because Nehemiah is a great one on leadership. Where's the Bible? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've been gone. Out of the, out of the practice. All right, ready to begin. Ready to begin. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. 
Some people be taking steaks, some people being taking chicken, so that every table there's a person with steak or chicken, and this person says, I got steak, this got chicken, wait a minute, then we move on. Okay? Um, who would be good at this? Grace. Hi, Grace. I want you. When Paul moves on, just to make sure everyone at this table has been served. So you're like a couple tables behind, just to make sure that they're, yeah, and you can kind of go, is everything okay? Did everybody get what they wanted here? And, you know, just make sure everything's squared away. It takes us about 15 minutes to do that, okay? At that point, We'll let people eat, and then we'll go around kind of in that same fashion with a bunch of people maybe taking a row at a time that have coffee, and because the dessert's already on the table, okay? And you guys can just kind of, you know, not making a pest out of yourselves, but just making sure part of you can carry pitchers of water, part of you can carry coffee, and we'll just do that like once or twice going through making sure that everybody had at that point we're done serving okay and then Marilee and I are going to be teaching 
I want all of you guys to go up and upstairs because the majority of you are going to get married someday and are not married, so you might as well know a little bit about marriage. Okay? So are we good for Friday night? Yes. So, oh, no. Oh, Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> We're still around. You say married couples get the night off? Yeah, then married. That, that's not you. When we want to get served, we honor we serve So the dinner is set to be at 6. So probably have all you guys there at 5.30. Perfect. Okay. okay. And actually, let me check. Because we'll, we'll probably maybe have you guys there at 5 so that we can, we'll have to work out whether they're eating that same meal. So we'll work on that. So plan on being there at 5. We'll have more information on Friday to let you know. But we'll probably have you just eat that same meal, whether it's before or after. So one of those. If it, I don't know whether it's going to be done far enough in advance to be able to go ahead and feed you. If not, we'll do it. Uh, you know, maybe we can set it up to have it being broadcast into the Sanctuary, I'll just have to see how we're going to do it. And maybe you guys can eat and watch all at the same time. But one way or another, you'll eat and serve. But wear your, your CBI shirts. Anybody have any questions on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be the maitre d', you'll be the, the maitre d's. All right? Yes. What do they call a female maitre d'? Is it a maitre d' too? Maitre d' both? Yes. Do the jeans have to be plain, plain black jeans, like no holes in the thing? I don't really care. Your black shirts are the main thing, black on black. Okay? That doesn't matter. Okay? Does anybody not have black pants? Okay. Hi. Your darkest pants. Darkest pants. And they're dark blue. That's fine. Your black shirts, make sure they're your black shirts are very beautiful and look good. Okay, now blot it up. They've been under your bed for a week, all right? Okay? Are we good? Wait, you said. Okay, so I wanted to go through Nehemiah anyway. You'll notice it's on your syllabus because Nehemiah is a great uh, lesson in leadership. Okay? And so let's go through beginning in chapter 1, verse 1. Okay? The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, came to pass in the month of Chislev, on the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Han and I, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. When I asked concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem, they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there. Great distress and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned up with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Our hearts need to be like Jesus, who looked and said, the fields, they're white, they're ready for harvest. That in whatever area of ministry God's calling us into, whether it's ministry here in the States, or ministry overseas, or ministry to kids, or ministry to men, ministry to teens, whatever it is, that we have a heart that wants to see the lost saved. That, and that we realize that whatever area of ministry we're going into, there is going to be spiritual battles. You know, I, I realized something while I was over there in the Republic of Georgia, and we were within miles of Azerbaijan. In fact, we drove to the border of Azerbaijan, which has been a war with Armenia up until about a month ago. And Armenia 
and Georgia are the oldest Christian nations in the world. So Georgia Christian heritage dates back to the disciples. Is that unbelievable? And this one church that in this little village where Vlad and Sabeta live, the whole story of that village is that the soldier who was gambling at the foot of Jesus' cross and won the shroud that was woven one piece, brought it back to Georgia. And that this... I don't know whether it was his mother or what the story was. I, I can't remember that aspect of it. But she just clung to this uh, garment of, of Jesus. When she died, she was clutching it. They buried her and they planted a tree. And miracles had, were just taking place there. So they built this church all around this tree. So it, it's still encased. You know, obviously it's not alive anymore, but the, the stuff of it is. But this church became a fortress for the 1200s when the Muslims invaded. And you heard my story on Sunday of the 100,000 martyr bridge. Is that crazy? Mm -hmm. How long would it take to kill 100,000 people beheading? Days. Yeah, like... Five months? I'm not sure how many people you could behead in a day, but uh, just because of their faith in the Lord, the Muslims quit. It's the only nation outside of Armenia that isn't Muslim today. Because all those nations were filled with Christians. The whole center of Christianity was Turkey. All seven letters in the book of Revelation, all seven letters that Jesus wrote, those places are all in Turkey today. Again, the, the Muslims killed all the Christians that were there. When, when I was at that place, remember there was a tiny little stone cross, and I said, you know, I don't know whether this commemorates where they were actually cutting off the heads or not, but there were boats going up and down the the, the river, and whenever a boat passed that area, the, the people turned and did the sign of the cross. You know, and this is what, 2,000 years later? Or, or 1,000 years later? So I really believe that God's honoring the blood of the martyrs of going back into the Muslim. How would you like Babbitt's comment that he wanted the Muslim countries to fund the gospel going back into the Muslim countries. Did you hear that? So by selling them the type of sheep meat that they wanted and all of that. I mean, is that awesome? <laughs> I love that. That was my favorite thing out of the whole trip was him saying that. But the point is this. The spiritual battles that you're always going to face, okay? How can you make the spiritual battles in your life stop altogether? Quit. Renounce your faith. Yeah. Go on the Broadway, backslide. It ain't going to bother you then. But you're moving forward. You're going to have spiritual battles. Everybody understand that? And this is where, while I was there, I realized the Prince of Persia the spiritual battle there is recorded for us in the book of Daniel. Have you guys read that? Yeah. yeah. So I realized we've had people in our church praying 24 hours a day for the last year. Is that awesome? Because we're going to need it to, to go forth. And the point is this. We're going to see that the very first thing that Nehemiah does is what? What's he going to do? He's heard the news. His heart's broken. And now what he's going to do? He's going to pray. So let's read the prayer. So it was when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned and fasted many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. That's a great line, isn't it? 
we serve the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O oh, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for your children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, of which we, do you see that? He takes responsibility in it with himself as well. At which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinance which you commanded your, Moses, your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of heaven, Yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen for a dwelling for my name. And again, beside that verse, I have 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people are called by my name. I also have 1 John 1, 9. You girls are going to hear this tonight because this is the scripture that Mary Lee is teaching. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. He's saying in this prayer, number one, he's taking responsibility even for the sins of the nation upon himself. And again, my friends, I want to tell you something. You will never get over anything in your life until you take responsibility for it. Until you acknowledge it. Until you stop blaming other people for where you are in life today. Okay? There comes a time hate to break the news to you, but you can't blame mommy and daddy anymore for your problems. Okay? You're an adult. You know the Lord. You have the ability to get your heart right before the Lord. you got to realize there are people who spend their entire lives blaming how they were raised or the things that have happened to them. And they, it becomes their excuse for their own failures. Does everybody understand this point? Yeah. Yes. Comes a time where you take ownership. I messed up. It's my responsibility. I want my heart right before you, Lord. And... I want to be available. Because the great news is God will redeem every part of our life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Is that awesome? And sometimes it's the ugliest parts of our failing life that God will use the most. Is that awesome? I mean, the worst failures in our life that God can use? Is that free? That's pretty fantastic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So when we realize that, then we can just have that heart that's right before the Lord. Now, we're going to find in chapter 2, four months pass. Okay? So let's begin reading. And it came to pass... In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. And again, my friends, all of this is such a critical time period because it's the basis of Daniel chapter 9 when the first command was given and Ezra goes back to rebuild the temple. 
Okay, all of biblical prophecies for the future, the backbone of that is Daniel chapter 9, which the background of chapter 9 is when the king gives the command to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, everybody got that? Now let's read on. In the year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing more if nothing but sorrow of heart. Then I became dreadfully afraid. The reason why is capital offense for him to be sad in the, in the face of the king. All right? And then I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies in waste and its gates are burnt with fire? And the king said to me, <clears throat> So what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king and your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Now, this scripture is for each one of you. All right? You're spending months here praying for God's will in your life. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. So you're praying that God is going to open a door for you. Right? right? Yeah. So, just like Nehemiah, he had prayed before, the king says, what do you want me to do? And did Nehemiah go, well, i got to go pray about it. He'd been praying about it. And I'm sure he said, in, in the city he prayed, uh, you know what he prayed? Help. He's like, Lord, yeah, I go, this is my moment. Your moment's going to come. And there are going to be doors that are open for you. And again, if you desire God's will, you're not going to miss God's will. Does everybody understand that? You only miss God's will when you don't want to do God's will. Okay? But if you've been praying about it, and a door opens up for you, then can someone tell me why you shouldn't walk through it? Um, I completely agree. I've just been taught the Gideonite story to pray three days and not be deceived in the but Lord's will. Did, did Nehemiah have that opportunity? Not at that time, I assume. So, I remember, did, and we had a, she was from uh, at San Juan Capistrano, Leslie, mm -hmm. little quite shy girl. I, you know, it, she was actually older, but she looked like she was 16. I think she was 27, 28 years old, you know? And it was like, really? I mean, I need to be drinking whatever you're drinking, because you're like perfectly preserved there in the fountain of life. She had 10 minutes to make a decision. She could jump on a plane. She had never been on a plane. I'm talking about a little private plane that lands out here at Yucca Valley Airport. Airport and fly to Idaho. But you know what? She did it. And in 10 minutes, she had a bag packed and jumped on a plane. And through that, she ended up marrying uh, Brian. Brian. And now they're pastoring in Lake Elsinore. Uh, not Lake Elsinore. Lake Isabel. Is that awesome? So you guys be praying all of this time. But when a door opens for you, and again, I'll tell you in my own life, and again, we all want to hear the audible voice from God, right? And I remember when I was in Kansas, and I had four kids by this point, we had a beautiful church building, a church of 300 in a town of 600, a two-story uh, parsonage house, five bedrooms. We had a two-story educational building. We had a youth center, the only thing in town. I mean, in a town of 600 people, we had the corner of the market on everything. We had a youth center 
as big as our sanctuary almost, okay? Pool tables, foosball, candy machines, ping pong, all of it. So our facilities and things were awesome. And people loved us, and it was a safe little town. But I began, a, there was a stirring in my heart that God was going to do something different. And then, you know, we came out here for a conference. The pastor of Joshua Springs was leaving, and he asked me to take it over. And we knew it in our heart. Was it scary? It was terrifying. Because we're leaving both our grandparents, our kids were little. You know, who wants to raise kids in California? You know, you gotta understand if you're not from California, everyone thinks people in California are Nancy Pelosi and, you know, Gavin Newsom. And that, you know, is just ridiculous. But here's the point. I'd go outside and I'd go, Lord, you don't have to spell out the whole word, but you could make an N out of clouds or a yes out of clouds. You don't even have to spell the whole word. Just put a little cloud formation Y. Or <laughs> God's never done that. The Bible says that he leads us by a still small voice. Okay? There was already a prick in my heart. And fortunately, my wife's heart. Again, for all of you that are single, there isn't anything more important than marrying a spouse that's going to want to serve the Lord as much as you do. And not be a Christian just because you are come to church because you're going to church. So, we left everything again for the second time in our life to come out here. And again, when we got out here, there was just the chapel and it didn't look like it looks now. Now it looks like a cool, nice building. In that day, it was just a white frame building that looked like the AA meeting house, you know? <laughs> it, and nothing else was around anywhere. And it was in August and hot and ugly and terrible. But the point is this, you're praying now. When a door opens up, there does come a time where you have to be prepared to walk through it. And Nehemiah was prepared to walk through it. And his response was, send me. Now, let me ask you a question. If you get to reside in the palace of the most powerful king in the world, how's life for you? Super religious. Yeah. And you're willing to leave everything to go where? And find what? Find everything broken down and in ruins? So, what does that tell us about Nehemiah? What? That his heart was for God. His heart was for God, regardless of where that was. So, I hope there's something else in all of you guys. I hope there's a heart in all of you that you're not putting God in a box. Well, I'll serve you as long as I can be in Kauai, Hawaii. So, putting limits on God, uh, well, God, I'll serve you, but I, I you know, I'm not going to consider that place or that place or that place. Where should we be considering? Anywhere. Anywhere, Anywhere in the world God wants us to be because... It's going to be the best place that we have. I told you before I went into the ministry, one of the things that held me back for a while, I was afraid if I gave my heart to the Lord, he'd send me to the middle of New York City. I'd never been to New York City. But in my mind, that was the worst place. I'd take Africa over New York City. And again, I realized, God knows. Does God want to bless you? And God will give you the desires of your heart, even though you don't know fully what that desire is. And if he does ask you to go to a hard place, it's, it's going to be the best for you versus living in a Persian palace somewhere. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's just so freeing when you start putting all your preconceived conditions aside and saying, Lord, I'm yours. Whatever you want to do with me, I'm willing. Just open the doors of what you want from me. Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? Anybody want to get off the bus now? <laughs> Are we still on the bus? Yes. Anybody bail? They pull the lever and say, stop here, I'd like to get off. <laughs> this is what I signed up for. <laughs> Are we all still good? Did I lose anybody? <laughs> oh, good. We're all still here. Good. I ask that you send me. Here am I. In the, in the Hebrew, it's Hanani. Here am I. So the king said to me, the queen also sitting before, uh, beside him, how long will your journey be in when you, will you return? So it pleased the king to send me in a nice sense of time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the regions beyond the river. He's talking about the Euphrates that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the king, keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Yes. Is that the Asaph from the Psalms? You know, I'm not positive on that, whether that's a common name or a term or what, but there is an ASAP in the Psalms, and I don't believe I have a note on that, so I'm not sure I can, I can ask the question, answer your question. And the notes in my, in my Bible don't say it, okay? That was a good question. How about this verse? According to the good hand of my God upon me. Say it with me together. According to the good hand of my God upon me. Again. According to the good hand of my God upon me. Again. According to the good hand of my God upon me. Does everybody believe God's hand is good? Amen. Even when we face things that we don't understand. Do we still believe that? <clears throat> and I'm living proof. Yeah, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death for 11 months. I closed my wife's eyes for the last time when she went to be with Jesus after 31 years of marriage and four children. And I got to see her, see Jesus. And I want to tell you, God's hand is good. I will fear no evil. Why? No. For you are with me. That doesn't mean we won't get sad. You know, I cried. But, you know, doesn't mean we won't be sad. What means <clears throat> is that he will carry us through. And God has a plan for our life. I love that one song. If I'm not dead, God's not dead. Okay? All right, any questions on that? Now let's go on. And then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. And when Sanballat, and Sanballat, his name means Thorn in secret. And Tobiah means mocking ridicule. Okay? You're always going to have Sambalas and Torbias in your life. All right? Just get used to it. Heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that the, a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem, and I was there three days, which he rested. You know, when you, like... You know, when we arrived in Georgia after, let's see, we left Monday at 6.30 is when our plane took off. We arrived in Georgia 
Wednesday at one o'clock in the morning. Okay? So, and there's 12 hours difference, they're 12 hours ahead of us. So you could subtract, but that's a long journey. And then the next day, we just kind of walked around the village and, you know, rested and, you know, did that. So when you travel, you need to rest to get squared away for what you're doing. Then I rose in the night and a few men, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuge gate, and I viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, its gates were burned with fire. Then I went to the fountain gate, to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me. And then, in, in, in other words, there was so much rubbish and rubble that he had to dismount. So I went by night in the valley and viewed the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, and the officials, or the others who did the work. Here's another thing in leadership. Sometimes you have to have a period of time in your own heart to work things out before you just say things. So you, you, you have to, for Nehemiah, see exactly the full extent. He just didn't arrive in to say, hey guys, I'm here to, to rebuild the wall. All right? He wanted to know firsthand what he was facing before he spoke the words so that there'd be no misunderstanding. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we're in and how Jerusalem lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them, the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's word that he has spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. So after he surveyed, then he lays out the mission. Let us rise up and build. And then they set their hands to doing this good work. But when Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Gershom the Arab heard of it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? Ridicule and making fun of us. And again, when you go into ministry, you just got to understand that is part of it. Okay? During all of my life, and it used to be by gossip and other things now, by social media, there are people out there mocking me, making fun of me, making all kinds of accusations. It always has been. Okay? Again, what do you do when that happens? Let the Lord defend you. You just keep going on. Because if you let that get to you, and it, does anybody here like people talking about you? And it bums us out, doesn't it? You know, and our first response is, well, that's not true, and blah, 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 you know, right? Remember Acts 20, 24? But none of these things move me. And this is the next key part. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life as dear to myself. That's the hard part, because we all kind of count our life dear to ourselves. Okay? Now let's go on. Any questions so far or comments? Yeah, Paul. Um, so when you're in ministry and the Lord lays something on your heart, even Mary, when this was put on her heart about Jesus, she pondered it in her heart. Um, yes. Just being silent, praying it out, scoping it out, planning it out, and then presenting it maybe before your board of elders and saying, this is what the Lord put on my heart. Yeah. Not just run into it, you know. Yeah. Okay. Although there have been times I've done that. I'll tell you an example. Um, and, it, it, and other people jumped on it. 
I just mentioned when I got back from Sudan a year and a half ago that they wanted us to build a church in the Nile Mountains and it cost twenty five thousand. Didn't ask for money or anything for it. By the end of the first service, I had people who had given me like ten thousand dollars. By the second service, I had twenty five thousand. Oh my! And I went. Well, I guess the Lord wants us to build a church in the Nile Mountains. I, mean, I really hadn't planned on it. And I wish it worked like that every time. Hey, the church, we need a million dollars to buy by the first service. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. That one worked, obviously, because God wanted it. Does that make sense? So there are times where, you know, it, it was different than that. But for the general basis, this is how we do things. We, we survey the situation. We look at it no matter how big the project is, and then we make a decision to go forward. So, for instance, when we built what is our present day sanctuary, terrible time in Yucca Valley. Building moratorium, all these things. People, there was a recession going on. None of the builders had works. There was not one house being built in Yucca Valley at that time, and God called us to build. And we had no money. And to begin with, we had $2,000 in savings, we cashed it into $10 bills, gave it out on that Sunday. 200 people came because the last person got the last $10 bill. We said, use that money to make more money. Came back with $13,000 six weeks later, and we poured the foundation. So it, it was, but again, we made the decision together. We're, we're going to build that back. And in that same building, then we had the biggest earthquake in California. In the last 40 years, 7.9, ground came up four feet, moved six feet out here, outside of town. Overnight, every property in Yucca Valley was worthless, and people were fleeing the city, and we were building. But you know what? Did God do it? Yeah. In spite of everything? He did it. So... So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right in the memorial of Jerusalem. Chapter 3. Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors and built it as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it. Then as far as the tower of Hananiel, next to Elisha, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zachar, the son of Emery built, and also the sons of Hasasa built a fish gate, and they laid its beams and hunting stores with bowls. And next to them, Memorah and the sons of Uriah, the son of Koz, made repairs, and next to them, and in this chapter, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, the entire chapter is this way. And next to him, and next to him, and next to him, and next to him, and next to him. Part of leadership is encouraging people to be a part. Because again, it only happens when all of us do what we can do. That's why I shared on Sunday. And in this building, you know, when, when John Randall and Mike McIntosh and Don McClure and the other guys, and we came and sat right here in this area, right here in this room. And in one afternoon, we hammered out Calvary Bible Institute, how we were going to run it, what we were going to do. That's the only meeting we've ever had for a Calvary Bible Institute. You realize that? About three hours, group of about 10 pastors sitting in this room in one afternoon. So we made the decision that was in April to do this and start in September. Now this place looked and smelled like a rest home. So for instance, in all of your rooms, there were these, yeah, like hospital type situations where you had like a hospital light, a health light, <laughs> you know, that you could flip on to get help. Uh, the 
hallways had like grab bars. grab bars, you know, to go down. They it had popcorn ceiling on everything. There was this nasty carpet, and we made the decision that we were going to do it. And our first Bible college student that we got, who came and he came early, had an ankle bracelet. You know, because he was still on parole. And uh, he lived here and he worked full time. And people from the church and the little old ladies in the church. And we had to get all this nasty tile off the floor. We had to bring in this big machine that, you know, like had a hammer blade on it. And the, the mounds of rubbish. I mean dumpster after dumpster after dumpster out of rubbish. There, there was a guy who had just retired as an electrician, spent one year donating his time to replace all of the electricity in this building. We replaced every fixture in this building. But the point is, it took a lot of people. And by the time September came, we had half the building done. And we could take 30 students and know it's what we had. And then we spent the other half of the building. Be thankful you weren't here then. Mm -hmm. Because every day there was drywall dust and stuff everywhere that had to be cleaned up. The, the cleaning of this building was like a big job during that semester. The point is this. Next to him, next to him, next to him, next to him. So as a leader, you have to be able to motivate people to be a part of it, okay? You're gonna get to see it on Sunday. I announced this Sunday that we're having, that we're buying chairs, okay? 750 chairs is $54,000. And I, I already gave a sync preview, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna ask people to buy their own chair. That's sixty dollars. Because you know what? If I said I need fifty-four thousand, how many people could wrap their, their mind around that? But if I said I need sixty dollars, yeah, and then that project will just be done, and we'll move on to another project. How is the chair sixty dollars? How? Yeah, they're exactly these chairs. These chairs. Actually, they are these chairs. No. So, this is the only chair made in America. Yeah, the rest come from China. And, see how it has this plastic on it? Yeah. Well, if you'll notice, the chairs that we have in the Thunderdome, same company, but this is, this is wood. And, you know how some of the seats fall off? Now they've been 20 years old. So they've lasted a very, very long time. So that's how they're, we can buy a cheaper chair from China, but these are made in Tennessee. And I said, yeah, we'll do it. Let's buy more money, or spend more money, buy the best chair, employ some Americans to make them. So that's how it's $60. Pastor Jeremy, how about we just get old pews? No. no. Because you would not like moving in for a dinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just had a question on that. Like, how, I don't know, maybe it's just like overcoming the, the fear of men, but how do you like, like get over asking people for money? For money? Yeah. yeah. Because part of it, you remember Jesus and the widow? And Jesus is watching how people live. And he watched the widow put in her two months. And you notice he didn't stop her from giving. Now, I would have kind of been in the place of going, save your two mites and buy a piece of bread. Okay? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul writes, it's to your advantage to give. So, the, and when I was young, when I was your age, 
It was like, I didn't even want to skip the scriptures that talked about giving. It was like, we'll just skip over those, you know? And I realized later on, I'm robbing people of the joy that the Lord wants them to give. Because if we, if I keep all the money, Jesus said this, wherever your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. There's where your heart's going to be. So if I keep all my money, where's my heart? It's selfish. And, you know, I got pretty snazzy pickup out there, don't I? I mean, it's, it's sweet. I like it. I still get in it every time and go, oh, thank you, Lord. I love my pickup. Do they make nicer pickups than that? Oh, yeah. They make nicer ones. Yeah. So it doesn't matter at whatever level you are. The wants in our life are always going to be more than what we could have. You know? But there is a blessing when people give. Proverbs 3, 4, and 5. BJ's going to cover it tomorrow night. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Hang on. And lean not to your own understanding. Just let me see what I read. This is in my Baby, is it urgent? I mean, class. Okay. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. But then it goes on to talk about giving. And it says, test me in this. If it is not true, book of Malachi says, will a man rob God? And then it goes on, yet you have robbed me. In tithes and offerings you have robbed me. And then the Lord says, test me on this and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. 2 Corinthians 9, it says that if a man sows sparingly, he's going to reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. And so as I grew in the Lord, I realized my hesitance, because the last thing you want is for people to come to church for the first time and now the preacher's asking for money. Okay? And, and so, you know, that's where all of that would come from. But when I read the entirety of the scriptures, I realized there is an eternal blessing of God for giving. Because we're going to be given an account. We're going to have to give an account. How did I spend my time? How did I spend my talents? And how did I spend my treasures? And did I invest them in the kingdom of God? And you know what? Like the guy who gave us this building, he has a gift of generosity. And you know, he, and the more he gives, the more God gives back to him than a blessing. So that's why I don't shy away from it. Yeah, but I'm not one of those hard sell preacher guys that says, yeah, I don't, you know, haranguing people for money and God's going to bless you, you give to me, and so I can live in a multi billion dollar mansion and drive a Bentley and, you know, all of that. But there is a blessing for people to be able to give. And so to facilitate that, and there's balance in that, you know. But I've watched God do it over and over. Okay? Any other questions? That was a good question. Any other questions on that? I was a little surprised. I thought you were joking. What's I literally? I thought it was you. Oh, what? Ask well, you yeah, asked him for money for the chairs. I'm like, oh, he's just kidding. And then you just said that. Like, oh, really? Okay. No, I'm, I'm going to do it. I think it's, it's a great idea. idea now. I, it's something everybody can wrap their brain around. That I can understand. And I can be a part of it. And in short order, it's just going to be done. It was funny because I got a call from my grandpa because he watches online. And he called me and he was like, so does this mean that if I pay $60 for a chair, then I have a reserved seat every Saturday? So I was like, sorry, no. <laughs> Don't go back to your chair. But he can take a purple chair home for him. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on that? All right, let's go on. And... That's not the purpose of our study today, so I'm not going to go through it. 
But each one of these gates also is a symbolic of the ministry and life of Jesus as we go through. Okay? So, let's jump to chapter 4. But it happened when Sanballat, again, what does his name mean? Thorn in secret. Thorn in secret. Heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. I have a note beside this in my Bible. When things are going well, get ready for the attack. When things are going well, get ready for the attack. Because there will be seasons in our life, you know, and I, for instance, I told Mary, I said, well, this ought to be a great week. I said, not only are we attacking the Prince of Persia, but we're doing a marriage conference. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, Angel, how, how could the Lord attack the marriage conference that we're going to do Friday night? How could he attack the teaching of it? Yeah. You get sick. Your wife gets sick. Yeah. Um, Something much more simpler than that. Someone said it. Yeah, we get in a fight. Oh, oh. oh, yeah. No, that's. You're going to teach a marriage conference? Oh, 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 oh yeah. No, like, trust me. The enemy's going to. That's. Just irritating to me. Oh, it's irritating to me, right? You know, it's like, yeah, it's over nothing. I should have asked a married guy. He would have got that right off the bat, right? <laughs> over nothing. Over nothing. <laughs> Look, I got two other married guys. Can you get a fight with your wife over nothing? Over absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Ray? Example. 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 You ever get in a fight with your wife over nothing? Example. You like that? I'm not going to do like that. It's always over. Amy, you very quick. There's always a reason. There's always a reason. There's always a reason, but again, and, and we got girls in here, so it makes it more fun. Women are like spaghetti. So it's like all of this twisted mass of somehow that makes sense in your mind. <laughs> Where guys are just going, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Right? Yeah. <laughs> this can't possibly make sense. Huh? <laughs> oh, yes. So. Just where are you moving in life? You know, you volunteer on the ministry. Just be prepared. And what this chapter is about is the different ways of attacks. Number one, mocking ridicule. That's what's going to start right now. So you can put it by these verses here right now. By verse 2. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble do Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish stones that are burned? And again, limestone actually can explode if it gets hot enough. So when the whole city of Jerusalem was burning, even some of the rocks would crack. Because of the extreme heat, all right? Now, Tobiah the Ammonite, what's Tobiah's name mean? Uh, mocking ridicule. What's Sanballat mean? Mocking secret. Mocking mocking secret. Mocking secret. Was beside him. He said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he'll break down their stone wall. Why would he give that an example? Because their walls are either burning, so it's fragile and probably cracked. But why a fox? Yeah, foxes are very light-footed, fast, in the dome. Um, 
So I was just thinking about his name. It doesn't make much sense that a mother would be like, I know what you're going to do. You're going to my side. Like, name Sam God. What is it? Is there, because this is Nehemiah writing it as he is. Okay. In Malawi, where we go, people name their kids things like that. Really? Yes. So, like you'll give Blessed and Annette, our lawyer over there is Trouble Kalua. So, his first name is Trouble. So, uh, we always joke, we said, well, she must have had trouble giving birth and then won a shot of Kalua as soon as she was done and named him Trouble Kalua. So, there you go. It can happen. Well, and he was probably a thorn in secret inside of her. You know, his foot was probably pushing up on her roof cage or something. Yeah, it's kind of funny. But no, we have, our lawyer is called Trouble Kalua. So you'll hear some of the funniest names over there. It's like, whatever happened to happen, you know, that's, that's what they named them. And um, in verse number four, we have another prayer. And as I mentioned Sunday, this is a Gidim prayer. This is actually the third prayer in the book of Nehemiah. And uh, Nehemiah has ten prayers in his book. The first one was chapter one, verse number five. The second prayer was chapter two, verse number four. Now we're on the third prayer, and it's, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach upon their whole he own heads, and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity, and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So this, again, is a get prayer. Every once in a while, you'll hear David pray a get prayer. So, we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had, had a mind to work. And it's very important in a ministry to keep the people rallied together to have a mind to work. And it says, Now it happened when Sambal and then Tobias, the Arabs and the Amorites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being closed, and they became very angry. And all of them conspired together against the attack Jerusalem and create confusion. So number one, by verse number two, mocking ridicule. Attack number one, mocking ridicule. Attack number two, by verse number seven, is a forceful attack. So there's going to be eight different ways of being attacked in these chapters that we're going to go through here. Okay? And you have to understand, one day the enemy is going to attack you on this side, another day he's going to attack you on that side, another time it's going to be an attack on this side. He changes his tactics. But what's the purpose of every single attack in your life? It's the same purpose. To quit. To quit. To get overwhelmed and quit. Okay? So every time that you get to that point that you're overwhelmed and quit, what should you remember? Right. It's too early to quit. It's always too early to quit. It's just an attack of the enemy. Okay? Everybody got that? Let's go on. Now the enemies are multiplying. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, and I love that, we made our prayer to God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Watch and pray. Do you guys pray? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. 
Is there anyone in this room that actually takes an hour in our wall of watching you pray? So, that may be something you want to pray about. <laughs> because, again, it's important that when we say and ask the church to do something, that we do it. So, my hour on that wall is from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock on Sunday mornings. So, that's when I get up. I spend that hour in prayer and then review a little bit, and I'm at church by 7. Okay? And, you know, since we're talking about giving, and I'm not trying to give my reward away, but I'm the first one to have the chairs. Because I'm not going to ask the church to do something that I'm not willing to do. Okay? In verse number 10, Then Judas said, The strength of the laborers is fading, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. Now, when I taught this at the pastor's conference uh, uh, two weeks ago, my main focus on this was talking to pastors about raising up the next generation. And one of the things that I used as an, ex as an example of this is rubbish. Because you start out as a young pastor and you're full of zeal and you're going to go forth and, and you're going to do that. Zach's going off to be a youth pastor somewhere and he's excited, he's happy, he's going to be serving the Lord. And then something's going to happen to him in church. And somebody's not going to be nice to him. And somebody's going to backstab him in the back. And there's going to be some parent that you know, doesn't like what he's done or something that he said. And, and, you know, you go on in ministry and then you become the pastor and you have a trusted friend and brother in the Lord who stabs you in the back and it just hurts you. You can't believe that they would do that to you. Uh, you multiply that over years and years and you know what you can have in your heart? Rubbish. You can become cynical and afraid of trusting people and keeping people at a distance and not trusting people. Maybe you want to raise up somebody and they, they betrayed you. And, you know, there's all kinds of things. All of us. And I remember this when I pastored in Maxville. We had this, the church building was fantastic. It was built in 1916. And they had, it had beautiful, ornate, tin ceiling, great big crystal chandelier hanging down, a two-story stained glass window. It was all brass and oak inside, and the design was just, I mean, they don't, people don't do that much craftsmanship anymore. And there was something else kind of interesting about this building. And it, we still had the original plans from 1960. It was called the Akron Building Design. And so they must have built a number of these churches. They had great big round windows as, as tall as the ceiling here, which were stars of David. Isn't that interesting? So, but anyway, I was up in the balcony. Nobody was in the church where nobody could see me. And I was kneeling down, and the Lord just spoke to my heart that one of the biggest problems in ministry would always be me. And keeping my heart right before the Lord. And that I would have to keep the rubbish out of my heart. And not let bitterness or hurt or betrayal or any of these things ever keep me from wanting to love the people and be with people. Can you see how that can happen? In every single one of our lives? And so always keep the rubbish out. For you girls... Tonight, 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9, that if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Okay? Any questions on this? All right? And our adversary.
adversaries. So attack number three is discouragement. So there, there was so much rubbish that their hearts were failing. So attack number three is verse number 10. Attack number three is verse number 10, discouragement. Attack number four is verse number 11, it's fear. Attack number four is verse number 11, it's fear. Attack four was uh, what verse, sorry? 11. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything until we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times, from whatever place they turn, they will be upon us. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall and at the openings, and I set people according to their families with their sword, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the leaders and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. I love this because it's like, remember the Alamo. Remember Pearl Harbor. Remember 9-11. Remember the Lord. It is this battle cry that they have. So ten times. And their threat was from whatever point that you are, you're going to be attacked. And again, really, as an entire world, we just watched it this last year. In any news, number one news story, and you'll notice it's not the number one news story anymore. It's not the number two news story anymore. It's not the number three news story anymore. It's not even the news story anymore. Have you noticed that? All of a sudden, it drops totally off the radar. But the fear story was this. You're going to die of Corona. Everyone's dying of Corona. You got to stay home. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to. All of this fear. Okay, did people die of Corona? Yes, they did. My sister in law died of Corona. So I'm not making light of anyone that died of Corona. But in the entire scheme of things, 99.9% .9 of the people. And no one died of the flu. <laughs> so, I've been a pastor for 40 years. Let me tell you something. Every single year, people die of the flu. And every single year, for as long as I've been a pastor, every hospital that I knew was filled to capacity in December, January, and February. But what was motivating, not just America either, the whole world, was fear. And, and that's where, I mean, I have people saying that I was trying to kill all of the Morongo Basin by still having a church. You know, when it was out there on Facebook and everything over and over again. And, were there every time that I got afraid? Yeah. yeah. What if it's true? I went to church and everyone dies. You know? And it was like fear is a paralyzer. Okay? So bad reports spread. The children of Israel, how many people did it take to kill an entire generation of people for 40 years? And the answer is 10. There were 12 spies. Ten. The report of ten people, which exaggerated, killed an entire population in the longest funeral march in history, which would go for 40 years. Okay? And the average pastor quits over how many people? Four. Six. Wow. Six people. Six people cause a, a, an average pastor to quit. Just because of that, 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 that. So, okay? Verse 15. And it happened when our enemies had heard that it was known to us, that God had brought their counsel to nothing again, 
That's always what he does. And everyone, and, and every one of us returned to the wall, and every one of us to his work. So it was from that time on that half my servants worked in construction, while the other half held spears and shields and, board, uh, and bows and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. And those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked construction and the other hand they held weapons. Charles Spurgeon, you guys have all heard of him? His magazine was called The Sword of the Trial. It's one of my favorite pictures in the Bible because my entire life in ministry has been battling and building. Battling and building. My entire life. There, there's never been a time where that hasn't been the case. So a sword in one hand, and a sword represents what? Word, word of the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. And again, as we launched Calvary Chapel, Georgia, I mean Calvary Bible Institute, Georgia, this whole concept of teaching through the Bible is just unknown to people. In, in, in Iran, you know, they get Benny Hinn televised in. They get these TV evangelists, and the people are sincere in their love for the Lord, but then they watch these guys. You know, and, and it's, it's the whole idea of teaching through the Bible and knowing the Bible for yourself. And so as I got to teach these students over there, it was so exciting to watch it because they could get it and they, they could just see it. And it became life-giving to them. And the thing is, it's something they can take back into Iran and it's going to work. And it's going to work in Peru and Guatemala and Israel and anywhere in the world. Russia, it works. Because the word of God is living. So everyone got it? The sword of the spirit. And then you always need to be building. You always need to be building each other up. Building up the kingdom of God. Ministering. The scripture goes on. And every one of the boulders had this sword girded as the side as they built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And again, second or first Thessalonians chapter four lays out what truth? The rapture. The rapture. And the rapture comes with the sound of the trumpet. So this is symbolic of that. That uh, the hope that we have out of Titus, which we studied a, a month or so ago, the hope of glory, that blessed hope that we have at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's go on. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, but we are separated far from one another on the wall. Therefore, Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally for us there. Our God will fight for us. Say that with me. Our God will fight for us. Our God will fight for us. Don't ever give up. So Romans 8 uh, lays out nothing can separate us. In verse 21, so we labored in the work. Half the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem that they may be our guard by night and working party for a day. So neither I nor my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes except that everyone took them off to wash them. And I always think that's pretty funny. It's like, hey, we want you to know we were clean. All right, yeah, we didn't take off our clothes. We, we were always ready for battle, but we did wash our clothes and take a bath. So I always think that's funny. The Holy Spirit added that. Since I'm asking extra of you this week for a Friday night, I'm going to give you a half hour extra now. Uh, so you're done. All right. Thank you.